Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, bonjour à tous et buenos dias a todos. I am Jerry Roth. I am the president of the UIA for three more days. And I am happy during these last three days of my presidency to be here at the Senate meeting. Uh, we're, all, we're combining this year our collective member session with our Senate. We have a wonderful group of uh, speakers today talking about the very important issue, very dear to all of our hearts of the independence of the bar. We have representatives from all over the world, including uh, Turkey, Malaysia, uh, and elsewhere around the world. We couldn't be more grateful for their participation. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. This is a very important topic to all of us as lawyers. With that, I'm going to turn the floor over to my good friend, Robert Burns, who is going to be leading us today. Uh, Robert, thank you for putting this together. I'm going to get off the screen so that I'm not in your, uh, so I'm not distracting everyone. And thank you all for being here and thank you for putting together this wonderful program. Gracias a todo el mundo y mil merci a todo el mundo por haber organizado este uh, programa excelente. Gracias a todos por haber organizado este programa excelente. Gracias y adiós. Thank you to the president uh, for those uh, words of introduction and uh, thank you all for attending this webinar. As the president has said, this is a joint session between the collective members and the bar leaders uh, Senate. Um, of the UIA. The topic is uh, unfortunately one that is uh, perennial um, and as the President has said, dear to all our hearts. It's fundamental to our work as lawyers and our ability to work as lawyers on behalf of our clients that we are able and our independence is respected. Uh, we know that uh, it is so frequently under attack uh, and even in my own home jurisdiction of uh, England and Wales, and I speak as a past president of the Law Society of England and Wales in 2016-17, it is only yesterday that some 800 practitioners wrote an open letter to our government uh, asking them to stop undermining the standing of the profession uh, for the work that is done by practitioners on behalf of immigrants which is causing irritation to the government of the United Kingdom. But that is probably um, uh, at the minor end of the scale in terms of attacks on practitioners that we see around the world. And we are extremely grateful, as the president has said, to have contributions today from practitioners in Malaysia, Mexico, the Istanbul Bar, the Ivory Coast uh, and Paris. And when I shut up, you can hear from those who have a real experience and uh, insights into this. The topic we want to approach is really on three levels. The way in which the threats to independence manifest themselves, not always government, sometimes other sources as well, uh, criminal influence and so on. How best to respond as a bar leader to best effect um, in that context? And what support should other bars offer uh, to colleagues uh, across the world uh, when they are in, uh, under pressure. We've heard much in an earlier meeting today of the work that is being undertaken by the UIA through its International Rule of Law Committee to provide tangible support to practitioners and to bars in different circumstances. As I say, we are extremely grateful to all our speakers for taking time to contribute uh, to this work today. And I'm grateful to my colleagues who will pick up the baton uh, as the meeting progresses, and in particular to Alfonso uh, Perez Cuela, who will introduce each of the speakers individually uh, in the running order that we have agreed. So that's enough from me because time is uh, short. Once uh, the uh, panel members have spoken, uh, the question and answer session was supervised by my colleague uh, Aldo and uh, I think you, Eugenia as well uh, will join in with that process before Aldo then sums up the meeting. May I invite those who are taking part, uh, watching this uh, webinar to post questions in the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen uh, and others who are um, supportive of the question, interested in the answer, can indicate uh, their support for that question. I'd ask you please to be brief in putting that question in. It's not an opportunity, please, to uh, submit your own statement on this topic, notwithstanding the importance of it. 
So thank you to our speakers. Thank you to those who participate. Thank you to colleagues. Uh, and now over to you, I think Alfonso, to introduce Stephen, our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you to our speakers. And our first speaker is um, Stephen Thuru, who is the managing partner of Messrs. Stephen Thuru and Sudar partnership in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He's a senior litigation lawyer and has been in practice for 28 years. His main areas of practice are general litigation, contract and tort, constitutional and administrative law, corporate law, employment law, energy law, and native title law. Stephen Reed Law at the University of Leicester and graduated with honors. He was admitted to the Bard of England and Wales at Middle Temple and was admitted as an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya. Stephen also holds a Master of Law degree from University of Malaya. He was recognized as a highly recommended lawyer by Legal 500 Asia Pacific, by the Chambers Asia Pacific, and he was recently categorized as leading individual for dispute resolutions as Legal 500 Asia Pacific 2019, as a distinguished practitioner by Asia Law 2020. Stephen was the 31st president of the Malaysian Bar from 2015 to 2017. He's currently the vice president Australasia of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and one of the vice presidents of Law Asia. And it's a pleasure to have you here, Stephen. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alfonso. Uh, distinguished panel members, Ladies and gentlemen, may I begin by bringing greetings uh, to you from Malaysia and the two other international law organizations that I represent, that is Law Asia and the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. It is indeed a privilege for me to speak today, particularly because of the special relationship that the Malaysian Bar enjoys with the UIA. At the 60th Congress of the UIA in Budapest, Hungary in 2016, the Malaysian Bar was the proud recipient of the inaugural UIA LexisNexis Rule of Law Award for our, I quote, strong and unfailing commitment to the defense and promotion of human rights and the rule of law, unquote. As the incumbent president of the Bar in 2016, I received the award and spoke on the importance of the independence of the Bar. It was at a time when the Malaysian Bar was facing attacks on our independence and existence. Uh, we had at that time been an independent bar for 70 years. The assault on our independence was in, in the form of draconian proposals by the government, which among others was to restructure the composition of the Bar Council, the executive body of the Malaysian Bar, and to alter our electoral process. The unmasked objective was to cow us into silence and to effectively neutralize us. The bar rose in protest and in defense of our cherished independence. And we were not alone in standing up for the independence of the bar. The UIA and many other national bars and international law organizations, all in all about 19 organizations, including some whom we had no interactions with, issued statements of support and wrote directly to our prime minister, asserting the criticality of the independence of the bar and, and counseling against the ill-advised and the narrow-minded plans of the government to weaken the Malaysian bar. I am happy to report today that the threat to our independence was warded off and the proposals were eventually dropped. We remain today an independent bar and we are grateful for the international solidarity that we enjoy in our time of need. This brings me to my first point. It is about protecting the independence of the bar. Bar leaders and bar associations must stand together when the independence of the bar is under attack. It may be the individual lawyer discharging his functions, or it may be the bar associations carrying out its societal duties. It does not matter. To paraphrase a popular adage, when the independence of the bar is under attack somewhere, it is under threat everywhere. 
The experience of the Malaysian bar is a recent case study of the benefits of cooperation amongst bars, national and international, in the face of threats to the independence of the bar from whatever source. Our government could not ignore the formidable force of bar associations standing up in unison for the principle and, for, and few governments, I dare say, will be able to do so. So we must accept that we share a common heritage. It is the universal principle of the independence of the legal profession. There may be shades of differences amongst us, but the core values or imperatives are the same the world over. It is a principle that is worthy of protection. It is not meaningless verbiage. As a famous English judge once said, and I quote, no greater misfortune can befall the administration of justice than an infringement of the independence of the bar or the failure in courage in our advocates, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, we are today throughout the world struggling to cope with the pandemic. The consequences to public health and safety are dire and the loss of lives is quite devastating. We are grateful indeed to our many frontliners who rest, risk your well-being for others. However, under the cover of the pandemic and leaving aside the many legitimate efforts to contain the pandemic, we are also seeing another worrying, troubling casualty of the pandemic. It is the rule of law. Why is that so? So this brings me to my second point. It is this. It is about promoting the independence of the bar at all times. The bar whether it is individual lawyers, bar leaders, or bar associations are, with the greatest respect, the frontliners in the defense of the rule of law. This role is part and parcel of the principle of the independence of the bar. As daunting as the pandemic is for all of us, we must still remain vigilant and speak up when we find that the rule of law is violated and the pandemic is used as an excuse. As a distinguished former president of the Malaysian Bar said, and I quote, the legal profession's traditional role has been and still is to uphold and preserve the rule of law. And in discharging this central function without fear or favor, it has become, it has come to be regarded as the sentinel and the guardian of the fundamental rights of the individual, unquote. You would have noted, and it has become a norm for many governments the world over to pass laws or to, take or to take the route of delegated legislation or even administrative directives or edicts that impinge on and breach fundamental rights or human rights, all in the name of fighting the COVID-19 virus. This is a very dangerous path and a slippery slope that our governments have embarked on. If left unchecked, they, this type of unfettered exercise of power can be addictive. It is placed by most governments beyond the pale of scrutiny and review of the courts. And ultimately, this is a recipe for rule by law in our governments. We should not ignore the serious health and safety con concerns of the pandemic. We must accept there are no ready-made solutions as yet, as yet at the moment. However, we must remain alert that the rule of law is not sacrificed as we battle the pandemic. Let me give you a few examples of what has been happening under the cover of COVID-19. You cannot escape notice that after the pandemic was declared by the World Health Organization, the national security law for Hong Kong was passed. Now it is the single most in recent times, the single most controversial piece of legislation. There have been concerns over due process and freedom of speech. Then there is, I think in the pipeline still, the proposed 20th Amendment to the Sri Lankan con Constitution. It is seen as an attempt by the new government to reverse the rule of law constitutional provisions, which were put in by the previous government. It concentrates power in the hands of the president and relegates the judiciary to a position inferior to the executive and legislature in a scheme, in a Westminster scheme of separation of powers. Now, closer to home in my country, and this can't, can't be more hot off the press or hot out of the oven, as you may say, just over the weekend in Malaysia, there was an attempt to impose emergency powers on the basis that it was needed 
to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. Fortunately for us, our constitutional monarch, acting under his constitutional discretion, refused to declare an emergency. It is widely perceived that the attempts to invoke emergency powers in Malaysia was for ulterior purposes unrelated to the pandemic. These may well be either coincidental or dubious laws under the cover of the COVID-19 pandemic. Whatever it is, insofar as Malaysia is concerned, we spoke up, the bar in Malaysia spoke up against what we saw as a nefarious attempt to abuse the COVID-19 crisis for political purposes. Why? Why did we speak up? Because that is what is expected of an independent bar, whether as individuals or as the organization. I wish to conclude by just commending this to you. Now, the Malaysian bar has one of its main statutory objectives, the duty to uphold the cause of justice without regard to its own interests or that of its members, uninfluenced by fear or favor. That's a statutory mandate. It is found in the statute that uh, creates the Malaysian bar. Now, we consider this to be our rule of law mandate. So in these unprecedented times, I would commend this mandate to all independence bar, independent bars in the promotion of the independence of the bar, that we will stand together to uphold the rule of law, regardless of the pandemic, without fear or favor. And I conclude really by just leaving this thought with you. Whilst there may be times where we are powerless to prevent injustice, there must never be a time when we fail to act or speak up against injustice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker, my colleague from Mexico, Claudia de Buen Una. She has a master in family law at the Instituto de Ciencias Jurídicas de Estudios Superiores. Three specialities at the Universidad Amparo uh, on commercial trade. She's partnered of, of Bufete de Buen and Litigant and Civil Family Matters. And she's vice president and president elect of the Barra Mexicana Colegio de Abogados. Claudia, it's a pleasure to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Alfonso. Hello, dear colleagues and friends. I'm pleased to participate in this forum and to have the opportunity to exchange information and experience of a transcendental and extremely important matter. The actions that government and companies have taken to intimidate or control the bars and law societies or, law or, the, or the lawyers themselves. These actions are preventing the free exercise of the profession in various ways through the control of communications, control of the contents of the academic meetings, as well as the way in which they have, been, have wanted the bars and law societies to intervene to legitimize their actions through communications in networks previously in the written media. In order to understand what's happening in Mexico, it's necessary to do a brief historical review starting in the previous century during the 17 uninterrupted years, we had the pre partido party in charge of the government, an hegemonic party will, which effectively controlled the three branches of government, the executive, judiciary, and legislative, as well as some academic institutions. Sadly, several bar associations were created to applaud and legitimize the ruling government actions. These are the so-called official bars, which continue to act in accordance with the government or political party's interest. There are three most, the three most important associations, the Barra Mexicana Colegio de Abogados, El, la, El Ilustre Nacional Colegio de, de Abogados, uh, y, uh, y la Asociación Nacional de Abogados de Empresa, ANADE, INCAM, um, BMA, have traditionally remained independent. Occasionally, however, some bar members are tempted to succumb to thoughts validating political agendas regardless of their legitimacy. Sorry. 
I recall some statements supporting intransigent measures by the incumbent government that, that affect an important social sector, but which were applauded by some of the, these associations or remaining silent in the face of the human right violations. Fortunately, this is happening less fre frequently lately. In the year uh, 2000, the right wing political party, the PAN, was able to put an end of the long pre-domain with when Vicente Fox became a president. Unfortunately, Fox's lack of leadership, the favoritism for a certain sector of the society, the lack of transparency in the administration, and above all, his excess and verbal blunders intensified the crisis to regret of many of his supporters. The following president was Felipe Calderón, who took office amidst many complaints given the very narrow margin he obtained vis a vis his opponent, our current president, Andres Manuel Observador. Sorry. This situation created by a very deep crisis the Mexican society. Calderón's six years term was characterized by the war against drug trafficking with was with, uh, which was truly tra tragic. Thousands of deaths and great insecurity, which still prevail today. The next six years term but, uh, was won by Enrique Peña Nieto from the PRI, the most serious corruption we have experienced. Even blatant evident was every present during the regime. It says that the government was permitted by the interest of drug traffickers. Today, com coincidentally, General Cienfuegos, who was the Secretary of Defense with Peña Nieto, has been arrested in the United States, accused of facilitating the work of the drug cartels. Other important high official of the pre-government has arrested in Spain for corruption. I'm referring to Emilio Lozoya. In addition, three governors of same party also, another important high officials has been accused of corruption and missing ones. Their defense attorneys are despised by the government and sometimes prosecute of charge of corruption or the money or money laundering. Lopez Obrador, who by the way, won the 2018 election by an impressive majority has broken with many paradigms sending a message of division and polarization between rich and poor, confronting us and openly manifest, manifesting his disagreement with the laws and, normal, and norms that prevent his from working for the less fortunate. In this government, whose partner is the fight against the corruption, the rule of law is not respected. The President Lopez Obrador complains that law sometimes get in the way and prevent immediately actions from being taken to govern and lawyers we simply cannot accept. The current government disdains some legitimate process, process that it should abide by uh, order to carry out this, its activities at the execu executive branch. For example, he, it has submitted important decisions to popular consultations, such as whether or not to put ex-presidents and officials on trials for alleged corruption. Most of the crimes of which the ex-presidents are accused should be prosecuted of ex officio in accordance with our constitution, instead of holding a popular consultation to decide whether to proceed judicially or not. The reality is that this government has not respect our profession, has not respect the rule of law. On the contrary, it has despised us and has said in public that it is going to expose lawyers who carry out advisory activities in favor of their clients, especially in tax matters, which it describes as cheating. The Mexican government intend to prevent lawyers from being able to defend their clients in tax matters by intimidating them through the tax authorities. Clients told to come to the tax authority offices without lawyers to negotiate tax agenda agreements, excuse me. 
Following the offensive development, the American Bar Association sent a letter to President Lopez Obrador on October 20, a few days ago, denouncing that the Tax Administration Service, the SAT, points out the lawyers are not an obstacle to, to transformation goals of the Mexican government. And SAT officials ask companies to approach them directly without legal representation. The letter is entitled Respect for the Rule of Law and for the Right to Legal Representation. And it demands that the Mexican government allows legal representation and respect the right to practice law. On our part, the, the, American, the Mexican Bar Association has issued several communications and press releases against government decisions that put the rule of law in jeopardy. Personally, I don't sympathize with all of these communications because I think that some of them are about political issues and unnecessarily disrespectful rather than being exclusively legal nature. We have demanded in, uh, in many and diverse spaces that the legal profession has been denigrated on, on various occasions, be respected as well as the Bar Association. We will continue to do so as many times as necessary. The government strategy has not been to make alliance to legitimize its actions as it has been in the past with other uh, regimes. On the contrary, it has launched a campaign to denigrate our profession and even generate animosity, especially against the major law firms. It's important to remain digital, vigilant in order to defend our profession and the rule of the rule of law. If necessary, in due course, we will ask the, uh, the UIA to support our, our bar with a precise pronouncement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. And our next uh, speaker is Mehmet Durakoglu. He's an attorney at law. He's president of the Istanbul Bar Association. He graduated from Ankara Atatürk High School, followed by a bachelor's degree at Istanbul University, faculty of law. He started to work as a legal practitioner in 1986, gave lectures in certificate programs on foreign trade. He has published articles on foreign trade. He was a member of the Executive Committee of Human Rights Center in Istanbul Bar Association. Having been in the position of an active member of board of directors of Istanbul Bar Association in 2004. He was assigned as the vice president of the bar in 2006. He was the vice president of Istanbul Bar Association for three consecutive terms between 2010 and 2016. Durakoglu was elected as the president of the Istanbul Bar Association in 2016. He was re-elected for the terms 2018 and 2020. He served as a member in association of contemporary light living along with being an active member of Social Democracy Foundation and Turkish Social Economic and Political Research Foundation. It's an honor to have you here, Mr. Durakoglu, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us. Değerli katılımcılar, sevgili meslektaşlarım, COVID kuşkularının fiziki buluşmaları olanaksız kıldığı bu evrede dayanışmamızı teknolojiyle sürdürmek sadece avukatlar olarak bize özgü olmasa da bizim buluşmalarımızın hizmet edeceği adalet arayışı herkesten farklıdır. Farklıdır çünkü eğer adalet duygumuzu kaybedersek bunun COVID kadar tehlikeli olacağını biliyoruz. Distinguished participants, dear colleagues. In this space, when COVID-related concerns make physical meetings impossible, maintaining our solidarity with technology is not unique to us as lawyers alone, but the pursuit of justice that our meetings will serve is different from everyone else. It is different because we know that if we lose our sense of justice, it will be as dangerous as COVID itself. Şimdi biz de ülkemizde budur. <coughs> 
bu duygunun kaybedilmemesi için yaptığımız mücadelede çok önemli bir zaman dilimini yaşıyoruz. Mayıs ayından bu yana siyasal iktidarın düşündüğü bir projesini uygulamaya soktuğuna tanık olduk. Adalet Bakanlığı'nın ve TBB'nin haberi olmadığı bir yasa değişikliği bir anda gündemimize geldi. Now in Turkey we are going through a very important period of time in our struggle to prevent this feeling from being lost. Since May we have witnessed that the political power put a planned project into practice. An amendment that was pre that was not previously known by the Ministry of Justice and the Union of Turkish Bar Associations came to our agenda. In the amended law, while it was ensured that more than one bar association could be established in big cities, the weight of delegates of the bar associations in big cities in the union was also destroyed. Siyasal iktidar bu değişiklikleri gerekçelendirirken seçim sistemindeki temsilin demokratik olmadığını ileri sürüyor ve baroların siyasallaştığını söylüyordu. Oysa yaşanan süreç itibariyle asıl amaç avukatların ve baroların susturulup sindirilmesiydi. Giderek artan insan hakları ihlalleri karşısında baroların yaptığı mücadele iktidarı rahatsız ediyordu. Kadına karşı şiddetle mücadele eden ve kadın cinayeti davalarında ısrarla izleyen barolardan iktidar rahatsız oluyordu. Özellikle de Toplumsal eşitsizlikler bakımından baroların yaşamsal gördüğü İstanbul Sözleşmesi'ne yönelik iktidar tepkilerine karşı çıkan barolardan rahatsız olan bir iktidar vardı. While the political power justified these changes, it claimed that representation in the electoral system was not democratic and that the bar associations were politicized. However, as of the process, the main purpose was to silence and suppress lawyers and bar associations. The struggle of the bar associations against the increasing human rights violations was disturbing the government. The responses of the bar associations, which became evident against authoritarian tendencies, disturbed the government. The government was disturbed by the bar associations that have been combating violence against women and have been following the cases of femicide insistently. There was a government that was disturbed by the bar associations that opposed the government's reactions to Istanbul Convention, which the bar associations regarded as vital in terms of social inequalities. These were the actual reasons the government could not explain. Bu değişiklik öylesine haksız ve öz itibariyle öylesine yanlıştı ki, ülkemizdeki 80 baronun tümü değişikliğe karşı çıktı. Başka anlatımda iktidarı oluşturan siyasal partilerle aynı dünya görüşünü savunan baro başkanları bile bu değişikliğe karşı çıktılar. Ee, iktidar bu çağrılara da yanıt vermedi. Bu gelişmeler üzerine ülkemizde baro başkanları tarafından bir eylemlik başlatıldı. Ülkemizin dört bir yanından baro başkanları başkent Ankara'ya yürüme kararı aldık. This amendment was so unfair and so inherently wrong that all 80 bar associations in Turkey opposed the amendment. In other words, even the bar presidents who share the same worldview with the political parties that make up the current political power opposed the change. On two separate occasions, the presidents of 80 bar associations in Turkey came together and signed a call, which was against what the political power was about to introduce, declaring that they're ready to work together in case the proposal for amendment is withdrawn. The government did not respond to these calls. Upon these developments, an action was initiated by the bar association presidents in our country. Bar presidents from all over our country decided to march to the capital, Ankara. At the end of these symbolic marches, the presidents who gathered in Ankara were blocked by the police with barricades and were not allowed into the city. The police isolated the area we were in and we spent 28 hours under the rain. Bu eylemlerin de sonuç vermemesi üzerine yasa teklifinin Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi Komisyonu'nda görüşüleceği gün Kendimizi ifade etmek amacıyla bütün baroların başkanları olarak gittiğimizde bu kez de meclis kapısında kaldık. Beş gün, gece ve gündüz Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi kapısında sürdürdüğümüz eylem de iktidarı vazgeçirmedi. Nihayet yasa teklifinin Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi Genel Kurulu'nda görüşüldüğü günde Ankara'da toplanan baro başkanları olarak bize katılan meslektaşlarımızla birlikte yürüyüş yaptık. Since this action did not yield any results, on the day the bill was to be discussed in the Turkish Grand National Assembly Commission, we as the presidents of all bars in Turkey went to express ourselves. 
This time, we were not let in at the gates of the assembly. Our demonstration at the gate lasted for five days round the clock. However, the government did not give up. Finally, on the day when the draft law was discussed in the plenary of the assembly, as bar presidents, we marched together with our colleagues who joined us. Despite our actions, the majority who formed the government resolutely enacted the proposal. Although at first glance, it seems that we failed as a result of our efforts, the social interaction of this process had extraordinary results. Although the government succeeded in this change, it enacted a proposal that had no equivalence in society. As a matter of fact, the first new bar association established in Istanbul could not complete it its establishment for a long time. Established by pressure on lawyers working in the public sector and with many irregularities, this new bar association was not adopted by the overwhelming majority of our colleagues. Bu arada yasanın anayasa aykırılık iddiası da mahkeme tarafından reddedildi. Henüz gerekçelerini bilmesek de bu karar ülkemizde yürütmenin yargı üzerinde oluşturduğu bir baskının sonucuydu. In the meanwhile, the allegation of unconstitutionality of the law was also rejected by the Constitutional Court. Although we do not know the reasons yet, this decision was the result of the pressure of the executive on the judiciary in Turkey. We, as the lawyers of this country, we have been struggling with this reality for a long time. The system that changed, especially after the constitutional amendment in 2017, made the executive extraordinarily dominant. Increasingly, this superiority turned into serious pressure on the judiciary. Bizler bu ülkenin avukatları olarak özetlemeye çalıştığım bu süreçte ülkemizin hukuk devleti olma iddiasını kaybetmemesi için mücadele vermeye devam edeceğiz. Adalet arayışından da vazgeçmeyeceğiz. Umud, umuyorum ki başaracağız. We as lawyers of this country will continue to struggle to prevent our country from losing its claim to being a state governed by the rule of law during this process that I have tried to summarize. I will not give up our, on the pursuit of justice. I hope we will succeed. Bu süreçte avukatlar olarak yapacağımız dayanışmamız da son derece önemlidir. Bu dayanışmayı somut temellere dayandırabilirsek daha da anlamlı olacaktır. Bu bağlamda AB müzakereleri çerçevesinde 23 ve 24. fasılların açılması ve müzakere konusu yapılması ülkemizde yapısal reformları zorunlu kılacaktır. Bunu sağlayabilirsek dayanışmadan da somut bir sonuç elde etmiş olacağız diye düşünüyorum. Katkılarınız için şimdiden çok teşekkür ediyorum. İstanbul Barosu adına ve şahsım adına saygılarımı sunuyorum. In this process our solidarity as lawyers is extremely important. It will be more meaningful if we can base this solidarity on concrete foundations. Within this context, opening chapters 23 and 24 within the framework of the EU negotiations and making them the subject of negotiation will require structural reforms in our country. If we can achieve this, I think we will have a concrete result from solidarity. Thank you very much for your contributions. I pay my respects on behalf of the Istanbul Bar Association and on my own behalf. Thank you very much, Mr. Mehmet Gurekoglu. It's a pleasure to have you here. And our next speaker is uh, Joaquim Bileaka. He's attorney at law and co-founder of Brizua Azuziello is a former president of the Council of Cote d'Ivoire and through this function became an inspiration of the legal profession with the African Economic and Monetary Union. Member of the International Union of Lawyers, second vice president of the International Senate of Bar Associations, member of the International Arbitration Commission of the UIA, member of the Committee of Wise Men of the International of Bar Associations of Common Legal Tradition, trainer at the Advanced Regional School, also former president of the Association of Young Lawyers of Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Joaquim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert and all. 
I want to speak in French. OK. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je dois intervenir euh, sur l'indépendance d'avocats euh, en Côte d'Ivoire, mais je serai un peu plus prétentieux. Euh, je parlerai beaucoup plus des pays euh, de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Euh, parce qu'au niveau de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, nous avons une organisation régionale qu'on appelle euh, l'UEMOA, l'Union économique et monétaire ouest-africaine, donc qui regroupe huit pays de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, sept pays francophones et un pays euh, lusophone. Et au sein de cette organisation, euh, nous avons pensé que pour assurer l'indépendance des avocats, il fallait utiliser des mécanismes que nous exploitons nous-mêmes pour nos clients, c'est-à-dire assurer la sécurité juridique des avocats. Mais nous avons pensé que la meilleure manière d'assurer la sécurité juridique des avocats, c'est de faire en sorte que la réglementation de la profession d'avocat échappe au gouvernement national et donner un caractère international ou communautaire aux règles qui régissent la profession d'avocat. Et à ce titre, au sein de cette organisation, l'ensemble des barreaux, dans le cadre des mécanismes de régulation donc, de l'organisation économique dont j'ai parlé, nous avons pensé qu'il était bon d'adopter un règlement communautaire qui régisse la profession d'avocat. Et c'est ce que les barreaux ont fait, qui fait que depuis 2014, nous avons une loi qui régit la profession d'avocat, qui est en fait un règlement communautaire qui régit l'ensemble des barreaux de l'espace communautaire UEMOA. De sorte qu'aucune législation nationale, aucun gouvernement national ne peut interférer dans les modifications des textes qui régissent la profession, puisque le texte est désormais, est désormais, a désormais un caractère extranational. De sorte que toutes les mesures de protection, les principes qui gouvernent la profession d'avocat, sont réglés à un niveau extra-national, donc à un niveau communautaire. Ça, c'est la première réflexion et le premier fondement de, des éléments qui font de notre indépendance. Donc, nous échappons tous au niveau de l'UOMOA aux législations nationales. Maintenant, au niveau communautaire, ce texte permet également donc, de aux avocats de l'ensemble des pays de l'UMOA, la libre circulation, le libre droit d'installation dans chacun des pays, de sorte qu'aujourd'hui, euh, si vous êtes à Bidjan, que vous voulez exercer au Sénégal, ou au Niger, euh, en Guinée-Bissau ou bien à, à Lomé, vous n'avez pas de procédure particulière. Vous y allez, vous plaidez comme si vous quittez une région française pour aller plaider dans une autre région française. Au-delà de ce mécanisme, nous avons également ce que nous avons mis en place, qui est la conférence des barreaux de l'UOMOA. De sorte que tout texte de la sous-région, qui n'est même pas un texte juridique, mais qui a une incidence sur la profession d'avocat, doit obtenir l'avis obligatoire de la conférence des bâtonniers. Si les législateurs nationaux ou communautaires prennent un texte ou envisagent de prendre un texte, sur le plan économique ou sur le plan de la sécurité. Mais si les avocats estiment que ces textes ont une certaine incidence sur la profession d'avocat, la communauté est tenue d'obtenir l'avis préalable des barreaux, se conformer à la lecture que les avocats feraient ou feront de ce projet avant d'adopter le texte. Ce qui fait que nous sommes devenus presque incontournables et nous échappons à la, au législateur national. L'indépendance des avocats également, nous l'inscrivons dans l'organisation de nos barreaux. Parce que très souvent, euh, on affirme l'indépendance, mais si nous ne faisons pas attention au mécanisme des textes qui organisent les barreaux, on peut y trouver 
des moyens de contournement de l'indépendance et faire en sorte que les pouvoirs publics, les gouvernements, interfèrent dans la vie des barons. Et donc, pour échapper à cette interférence, nous avons fait inscrire dans le règlement communautaire qui régit la profession d'avocat, l'ensemble des mécanismes de désignation des dirigeants des barreaux, l'ensemble des mécanismes d'adoption ou d'admission des avocats au sein des barreaux, qui fait que cette admission et la désignation des dirigeants relèvent de la compétence exclusive des avocats. En cas de contestation, notamment de l'admission d'un avocat, par le passé, en cas de contestation, le recours échappe aux avocats. Lorsque le conseil de l'ordre refuse d'admettre un avocat, la personne qui n'a pas été admise fait un recours, c'est la cour d'appel ou l'assemblée générale des magistrats de la cour d'appel qui statue en recours contre la décision du conseil de l'ordre ou du bâtonnier. Ce qui fait qu'en voie de recours, les avocats sont exclus du champ d'appréciation de la régularité d'admission d'un avocat. Et nous avons donc obtenu qu'en cas de recours contre les décisions d'admission d'avocats, il y ait une juridiction paritaire d'appel composée de sept personnes. Trois magistrats ayant rang de président de chambre de la cour d'appel, trois avocats, et cette juridiction est présidée par le premier président de la Cour d'appel. De sorte que lorsqu'il y a un recours contre une décision du Conseil de l'ordre ou contre une décision du bâtonnier, en appel, c'est cette juridiction qui a seule compétence pour statuer sur la décision du Conseil de l'ordre. De sorte que des avocats siègent au sein de cette institution d'appel et donc donnent leur avis sur le bien fondé ou le sens que cette juridiction prendrait pour réguler la vie du barreau. Il en est de même en matière pénale. Lorsqu'une poursuite doit être engagée contre un avocat, la seule autorité habilitée à engager la poursuite est le procureur général près de la Cour d'appel. Et ce procureur général doit, pour engager sa procédure, recueillir l'avis du bâtonnier, l'avis préalable du bâtonnier. Faute de le faire, toute la procédure s'annule. Donc, nous avons ces éléments de protection qui nous garantissent une certaine maîtrise de l'avis du barreau, donc une certaine indépendance, au moins sur le plan institutionnel. Il y a également la question de l'indépendance financière. Le barreau ayant obtenu leur indépendance, il faut également s'assurer que nous ne dépendions pas financièrement d'un organisme étatique ou de puissance extérieure qui pourrait influencer les décisions qui sont prises. Nous avons pu obtenir, à la lumière de ce qui se fait en Europe, un droit de plaidoyer, une sorte de timbre que nous apposons sur tous les actes de procédure initiés par les avocats. Et ce droit de timbre est... C est, c est, c est, donc les fonds qui résultent de ce droit de thème sont reversés donc, euh, au barreau, qui permet au barreau d'amplifier euh, ses revenus, aussi bien avec les cotisations des avocats, comme ça se passe dans tous les autres barreaux, mais également avec le droit de thème et des subventions que nous pourrions obtenir des organisations internationales, ce que nos textes anciens ne nous permettaient pas d'obtenir. Donc, nous avons l'indépendance euh, institutionnelle. Nous avons l'indépendance financière et en termes de fonctionnement, je vous ai parlé tantôt de la conférence des barreaux. Je, ra je rappelle que cette conférence des barreaux apparaît un peu comme euh, une sorte de parlement qui donne son avis et qui fait des propositions de texte sur tout ce qui concerne la vie des avocats. Et je le dis, 
cette institution elle intervient, mais dans son intervention, elle doit donner un avis obligatoire. Ce qui consiste à dire qu'aucune décision qui touche à la vie des avocats ne peut être prise sans que la, le, le, la conférence des barreaux se soit prononcée sur le bien fondé de cette décision en ce qui concerne la question des dépendances et ce qui touche à la vie euh, du, de, de, des barreaux. Alors, voici euh, en gros ce que je souhaiterais dire euh, en ce qui concerne la question de l'indépendance. C'est vrai que nos confrères ont soulevé des questions spécifiques dans leur pays euh, respectif, mais nous, nous avons essayé de trouver des solutions. Euh, parce que tout, ce que tout ce qui a été dit, nous l'avons vécu également, puisque par le passé, lorsque nous avons des contentieux avec les pouvoirs publics, on nous opposait le fait que nos usages professionnels n'étaient pas écrits. C'était des traditions, euh, on nous opposait chaque fois l'absence d'écrit. Et donc cette fois-ci, nous avons fait mentionner par écrit euh, tout ce qui nous semblait être de l'ordre euh, de la protection euh, des avocats. À ce titre, les avocats de la sous-région de l'UOMOA, je vous ai parlé des huit pays membres de l'UOMOA, bénéficient de l'immunité de parole et de l'immunité d'écrit dans l'exercice de la profession d'avocat. Donc, nous avons l'immunité de la parole et l'immunité de l'écrit. Les avocats de la sous-région UOMOA ne peuvent être poursuivis, ne peuvent être entendus ou détenus sans ordre express du procureur général ou du président de la chambre d'accusation, le bâtonnier préalablement consulté. Donc, on ne peut pas de façon expéditive poursuivre un avocat, même quand il exerce une activité qui peut ne pas être interprétée comme étant une activité professionnelle, les barreaux s'arrangent le droit de jeter un regard sur cette question. Nous avons un exemple, le cas d'un ancien bâtonnier du Burkina Faso, qui était poursuivi par le régime militaire parce qu'il serait, selon les dires de ses poursuivants, impliqué dans un coup d'État militaire. Il faisait l'objet de poursuites. Immédiatement, tous les avocats de la sous-région ouest-africaine, nous avons délégué des mandataires que nous avons envoyés au Burkina Faso, qui se sont constitués comme avocats pour jeter un coup d'œil dans ce dossier. On nous a rétorqué qu'il ne s'agissait pas d'une affaire judiciaire, qu'il s'agissait d'une affaire politique. Nous avons dit non, il s'agit d'un avocat. Et tant qu'il s'agit d'un avocat, aussi longtemps que le bâtonnier n'avait pas pris le soin d'apprécier le bien fondé des moyens de poursuite, nous ne pouvons pas arguer que la poursuite échappe au mécanisme prévu par le règlement dont je, je parle. Et nous avons donc obtenu l'élargissement de ce confrère, parce qu'après moult procédures, il s'est avéré que les, les éléments de protection qui devraient concourir au bien fondé de la poursuite d'un avocat n'ont pas été observés. Nous avons donc obtenu son élargissement. Donc, il y a une certaine efficacité dans la mise en œuvre de, du règlement euh, qui nous concerne et que nous estimons que c'est une bonne protection que les avocats ont pu obtenir par l'instauration de ces règlements professionnels qui a une dimension extra-constitutionnelle qui dépasse donc le législateur national et donc qui nous permet voilà, d'avoir une bonne balise. Voilà. Chers confrères, je ne vais pas être trop long, je sais que le temps qui m'était imparti était assez limité. Donc, je veux vous remercier de m'avoir écouté et nous allons peut-être échanger avec les expériences des uns et des autres, voir qu ce qui peut être amélioré pour renforcer l'indépendance des avocats. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.
uh, Joaquim. And next, uh, our last speaker is Olivier Cousy. He is former member of the Paris Bar Council in charge of international relations. Uh, and Olivier Cousy is batonnier of the Paris Bar 2020-2021. As a legal professional, Olivier Cousy helped to set up intellectual property, telecommunications, media, and technology practice group. He is widely acknowledged for his experience in handling both criminal and commercial disputes, press, intellectual property, advertising, telecommunications, and the internet. Olivier Cousy is regularly ranked as a leading individual in the main legal directories, such as Chambers, Legal 500, Who is Who, Legal, or Best Lawyers. Thank you for being here with us. Monsieur, the floor is yours. Please, the mic. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Hello to everybody. Uh, I I will turn my, present, my, my French presentation in English right now at the same time. So sorry for if any uh, misunderstanding or mis, misinterpretation. Um, I'm very glad to be a part of this uh, International Senate for the Bars. And it's very important for the Paris Bar to be a member of the United uh, International United Union of the Lawyers, l'UIA, l'Union Internationale des Avocats, which uh, the Paris Bar is, uh, is one of the friends uh, from the very beginning, and it's still uh, very close to this association. We are all facing to the same situation in every country, and France is not excluded from these uh, fears and these uh, issues. This year is a special year. Everybody told, everybody said that. And we have to uh, manage to maintain a kind of balance between the risks, the risks of health, the risk of the pandemic situation, the risk of the friends in France in particular, but other in all other countries for terrorism, uh, and the freedom our freedom, the freedom of each of us, the freedom for everybody and the rule of law as you, of, uh, some of you have mentioned before. The role of the bar is to be a kind of uh, watching about the situation, is trying to uh, make proposals and also to be a kind of intermediate between the low issues and the people. In every country today, we are facing dramatic situations. You spoke about uh, the situation in Turkey, situation in other countries. And I must say and remind you about this city, the tragic death of Mr. Montferrier Dorval, the our president of the Haitian bar who was murdered. Uh, and we are not uh, today aware about the reasons of this murder. From Paris to uh, every country, every other country, we are sharing the same battle that the rights for the people is to be so surely, safely, and efficiently uh, defended. The lawyers, every lawyer in every country has the same liability to be at the top of any kind of defense for the rights. We can't do that kind of task alone. We can't be in our own country and any kind of international group like the UIA, like the CIB, Monsieur Le Batonnier, the uh, Conference Internationale des Barreaux, any kind of groupment, structuring, where we can join our forces, join our reflection, 
sing together and we will be together smarter than alone. For that, we in Paris, in the Paris bar, we entertain to launch some um, project and it's a very important information to give to you that it in for the Bar Barreau de Paris, the Paris Bar has launched very recently a program which called Repeat, which means that refuging for lawyers uh, and lawyers who are threatened in their work, threatened in their activity of defense, could find a shelter to in Paris to be protected for a certain for a while. Any kind of lawyer in any kind of situation in danger could find in Paris any help, a place to stay and a legal defense and aid for each of these lawyers. That's something which is very uh, important. I'm very proud to, to, to support this program. And this program will be uh, declined and will be uh, put in the next weeks, uh, subject to our pandemic situation, for, of course. We have also, uh, in situation in France, and a few words, because if and even if the situation in France is not at all comparable to any country where there are some pressure, some physical pressure, and some strengths or risk for the lawyers to exercise their rights or exercise simply our job. Here in Paris, we have the feeling that there is something turning against the rule of law, something which is turning to contesting the fact that democracy, rule of law could be the solution. As a matter of example, there is a, a lot of debates because recently, as you may know, we have a tragic uh, terrorist attack, which uh, has been turned against one teacher. And this teacher was simply explaining what could be a caricature and what is the meaning of a caricature. This will be very tragic to see that after the death, some are discussing the fact that freedom of press must be restrained or not. That some discussions could occur regarding the fact that there is too many rights to protect uh, people who are committing such crimes. That in the course of the litigation open and the, the court situation about the, this Charlie, the newspaper Charlie uh, operations and caricatures, we are facing some, some people thinking that we have and we must restore the penalty of death in France. So we must be and we have to be to keep aware and to be very prudent in any situation because the rule of law is uh, not something which is def definitively adopted if we were, and even in any kind of country. So our role as lawyer and our role as bar associations is to be at the edge of this situation and the, on the edge of protecting the rights and also, and probably that's the most difficult to do, to explain rights to the people. The rights of freedom, the freedom of speech, the uh, freedom to, to, to, to go, the freedom to, to, to, to create, an, uh, to create uh, an activity, a freedom of commerce, a freedom of every kind of freedom could be challenged today by situation like pandemic, like terrorism, like uh, ecological risk, like any kind of risk which are considered as bigger than the rule of law. So I don't want to be uh, tragic myself. I don't want to be pessimistic, but I think it's our role and it's our duty today in the course of this discussion and according to what you 
very interesting uh, speech declare, uh, describes before that the bars, the lawyers, has to be very uh, careful in this role of protecting, defending, sustaining rule of law and freedom. As a matter of conclusion, I wanted to apologize for the fact that we won't be able to organize the uh, famous rentrée du barreau de Paris at the end of this year. And uh, I'm, it's very unfortunate and uh, I'm, it's a pity for me uh, to have you only by a screen, but it's a pity for everybody. And we will try to, to organize this uh, rentrée, hopefully at uh, the end of the first semester of 20, 2021, if and only if the situation of the pandemic is better. So it's my pleasure. I'm very happy to, to, to be among you, even if it's through these screens. And uh, I do regret that we can't see it shorter uh, in Paris sooner, but you are all invited to, uh, to come to Paris whenever you want, whenever we can. Thank you for that. Thank you, Monsieur Le Batonnier. It was uh, very interesting to hear from you and from everyone in the panelists. It really I have to say it was a really vivid and substantial uh, uh, meeting we had organized and we're very happy and uh, interested in what you told us. Uh, uh, maybe some of our uh, participants from outside do not know that they can put questions uh, through pushing a special uh, button on the right side in the, in, the, in, the, in the lower part of the screen. It is put uh, answer and question, A and R, or and, and Q, sorry, and Q or D and R. Uh, it depends on the, on the language. So you can feel free to put questions uh, through this uh, fantastic instrument. Uh, in the meantime, I'd go, I would give a good example to put a question to uh, one of the panelists. Uh, who is exactly the, uh, the last one, the uh, bâtonnier Olivier Cousy. Uh, uh, si vous voulez uh, nous expliquer, uh, en français, en anglais, en anglais c'est encore mieux, c'est quoi ce programme répit, si bien entendu, si vous pouvez faire le spelling, signifie quoi, c'est un mot en français, et it's an acronym or what. And I understood that you put, uh, you set up some uh, uh, structures to welcome people. There are people have to find a, a safe place and a, a lawyer to defend them. Just explain to us a bit more because it's an example, in my opinion, of what the bars can uh, concretely do in favor of citizens in a so difficult moment of our society. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the, the, this program is, uh, is quite similar to what we has been uh, implemented for the journalists, uh, which called SOS Press or to be uh, considered for the uh, for, for the, the, the, the intellectual or scientists which called the uh, called the pose uh, from the French college this uh, program which I would say repi repi it's uh, the French word it could be uh, translated as rest or something like that which is not an acronym uh, it's uh, it's uh, the possibility for a, a lawyer a lawyer which is uh, in danger in his country or her country to be uh, hosted in Paris for a while. And we will try to organize it with the help of this French state. Uh, the idea is to have a short uh, period of time where you can stay in Paris and to be uh, not physically protected, but uh, physically quiet and we could find a place to live, we could find some uh, solution for helping in terms of any kind of um, support. And in addition to say that we will able to organize with this lawyer, we will be able to organize uh, the, the defense or arguments for the defense of this lawyer uh, in its own country. That it's is very interesting. In, if I may suggest you can diffuse uh, uh, uh, this uh, uh, idea and this uh, project uh, through the instruments UIA, CCBA and so on, because it's very, very interesting. Everyone has to know that this program exists. 
is he, he, we, we, are, we are at the very beginning. So uh, we, we are launching the program. So it will be uh, released and it will be explained uh, later to any kind of international association, as you mentioned, as you suggest. But for the moment, uh, we have not, uh, it, it, it's not working uh, for yet. Thank you very much. I take for sure that Rosa has a question for some of our panelists. Rosa, am I true? Yes, I do. Uh, but first, I would like to read uh, the message that uh, Horacio Bernardes Neto, uh, the IBA president, sends to all the panelists. Uh, congratulations to all panelists and to the UIA. It was an outstanding session. I look forward for tomorrow's opening ceremony. Kind regards. I also want to congratulate all of you. And uh, while we wait for the other participants to send uh, their questions, I would like to um, to uh, make it the following one. Uh, state involvement in the regulation of the legal profession varies greatly and not all kinds of external intervention uh, jeopardize the independence of the bar association. In your opinion, what appropriate safeguards uh, can be adopted in those states where interference is more significant to ensure the independence and integrity of the legal profession? I don't know who from you would like to take this question. You can suggest a name if you like. Okay, so Stephen, maybe? Sure, Rosa. You can uh, start. Thank you. Yes, let me start. Uh, uh, the way in which uh, we have uh, uh, structured our independent bar in Malaysia is we, we are a statutory body. So uh, our, our, the, the, our duties, our functions are all within the four corners of the statute. Uh, and that statute is a statute that was uh, created uh, with consultation uh, uh, of the bar, and, and therefore it reflects uh, our aspirations, it reflects our objectives, it reflects uh, the, the, the, the need, uh, the, the basis of an independent bar. And so we protect that. Uh, we protect that and we, uh, it's not something that can be easily interfered with. Of course, government has tried to do that by trying to amend the statute, but it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, because uh, we, we, we uh, eat the bar invariably in most countries commands a lot of respect, public respect, and uh, public, there'll be a lot of public pressure uh, against government uh, from interfering with that. So we are not just a society, uh, a society that if it comes under, say, a, what we have in our country, a registrar of societies, that's difficult because then you surrender your autonomy to a third party. Uh, we are not uh, a company that comes under a company's commission, for example. Again, you surrender your autonomy. We control our autonomy. We are self-regulated. We are financially independent uh, as provided for in the statute. And therefore, we got uh, the, the, the, the protections we have in the statute uh, jealously to make sure that nothing is altered. So if we want something, and that's the other aspect of your question, if we want something that is beneficial for us, we are quite happy to move for an amendment for the statute to be modernized as the profession modernizes, but we will not agree to any attempts to dilute or to, to remove uh, the rights that we have, the independence that we enjoy. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we would like also to uh, know uh, Mehmet opinions, if you would like also to take this question. It could be interesting also if the panelists can put questions to each other. I imagine that the, uh, what we have heard is a, a good opportunity to, to deepen this uh, uh, issue, which is so important for the survival of our bars, but as we understand is essential also for the democracy and the society in, in its whole, as, as I understand. So maybe there are some curiosity from uh, some of our speakers. Uh, maybe, I don't know, but maybe uh, we have to understand, I will take for conclusions of the course, but there are something interesting things we heard from Joaquin and maybe Claudia, do you have any question or something to debate with other members of the, of the panel? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Um, may I, I don't know if I can uh, speak in Spanish, it's better for me, or I, I'm going to try to speak in English. Well, uh, I listen very carefully all of your uh, participations, and I think that uh, we have different problems in Mexico 
we we are being attacked attacked but uh, the the three uh, bigger uh, bars the i refer of them in my speech uh, we were together we were together defending each other uh, from these attacks but i don't know if uh, well let's start something let's say something we are not uh, in mexico the the uh, colegiación uh, alfonso colegiación is not apply the the the pertenencia the in the bar yeah okay it's not obliged so we are a lot of of of bars or in in the whole uh, republic so we need to be uh, very very very close in order to to to defend us from these attacks but i don't know if in your countries uh, uh, you can be in this the same uh, uh, in in this uh, you can have this uh, possibility to defend each other and to be uh, enforce you uh, with the other bars i don't know it, that's, that can be a, a question for uh, steven or jashim or or uh, mehmet maybe mehmet can answer so we it, we are very curious to understand his uh, reaction to what he heard from the from the different panelists. Please, please, Ma President Mehmet. Turkey's aslında bir otoriterleşme eğilimi söz konusu ve avukatlar olarak biz de bu eğilimden üzerimize düşen payı alıyoruz aslında. Actually, in Turkey, there is a tendency towards uh, being more authoritarian, and we take uh, uh, the kind of a part of it for the lawyers as well. Ee, bizim avukatlık yasamızda bizce önemli bir değişiklik oldu. In our attorney's code there has been a recent important amendment. Baroların etkilerinin azaltılması bakımından özellikle insan haklarına yönelik etkilerin azaltılması bakımından yapılan bir değişiklik bu. And this was an amendment uh, which aims at uh, diminishing, decreasing the uh, effectiveness of the bar associations in the face of human rights violations. Ülkemizdeki bütün baroların karşı çıkmasına rağmen yapıldı bu değişiklik. And this amendment was uh, enacted uh, as law uh, contrary to the reactions of all 80 bar associations in Turkey. Konuşmamda anlattığım e, toplumsal etkiyi yaratabilmiş olmamız nedeniyle toplumda da e, böyle bir değişikliğin yaratılması kabul görmedi. Uh, as I have previously mentioned during my intervention, uh, this was not publicly uh, accepted. Uh, therefore, this did also has kind of a, a negative stance from the side of the society in Turkey. Buna rağmen e, iktidar hiçbir şey dinlemeden e, yaptı. Despite all these, uh, the, uh, the political power did it. Contrary to the reactions of the lawyers, bar associations and the society as a whole. E, bizde özellikle 2017 sonrasında ortaya çıkan yeni sistem e, yürütme, yargı ve yasama arasında yürütmeyi çok güçlendirdi. And uh, the system uh, that came, um, the new system that came into the stage after the year 2017, uh, made the executive more powerful. Bu güç giderek yargının baskı altına alınması şeklinde de biçimlendi. And uh, it was sh shaped like this led to um, the pressures uh, of the executive on the judiciary. Ee, bu nedenle bizim açımızdan mücadele işin alfabesinin mücadelesi olacak. Actually the struggle uh, intends to mean for us uh, that it is a struggle for the alphabet. Yani demokrasi mücadelesi, yani hukuk mücadelesi, yani e, adalet mücadelesi. Uh, it will be a struggle for democracy, for the rule of law and for justice. Bunu yapamazsak demokrasiyi yitireceğimizi düşünüyoruz ki hukuk arayışlarımız boşa çıkacaktır. 
And if we cannot succeed in doing this, uh, this means that we will uh, lose, we will sacrifice democracy. Okay. That's okay. Thank you very much indeed for your clarification. Of course, this terrible amendment of, uh, if I'm not wrong, May 2020 is uh, something really horrible against uh, which not only lawyers, but if I understand well, even the, the civil society all over Turkey, or at least in Istanbul, because I know there is some difference between the country, the inner country, uh, the deep part of the country, and the Istanbul. Istanbul is a bit uh, liberal part uh, of, of the country. And uh, I hope anyway, and you can confirm to us, that uh, a terrible scene uh, uh, which we saw in the screen some years ago of lawyers and, and judges in Gorn, we are dragged along outside of the courts by police, is not more happening, I hope. It's a, it's a question. It's, it's not more happening. Only only once it happened because all of us have seen this terrible uh, movie, where lawyers and and, uh, and judges were dragged along outside the courts by police with force. Yani hakimler açısından o süreç sona erdi ama avukatlar açısından bu direniş sürdüğü süre boyunca bunları yaşamaya devam edeceğiz gibi görünüyor. Çünkü avukatlar gerçekten baskı altındalar. Actually this process that you have just explained explained ended uh, from for the judges. But as the resistance of lawyers goes on, it seems that this process uh, will continue for the lawyers. Bizim ülkemizde biz İstanbul Barosu olarak FETÖ'ye karşı yapılan mücadeleyi haklı görüyoruz. Ama e, bu mücadeledeki önemli olan nokta sadece bu mücadele için değil, bütün mücadeleler için adil yargılanma hakkının çok önemli olduğunu düşünüyoruz ve kaybettiğimiz değerin de bu olduğunun farkındayız. As Istanbul Bar Association, we agree uh, uh, with the struggle against FETÖ terrorist organization. However, what we... Uh, pay a great importance is the right to fair trial in every process. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry if I insist a bit with uh, Turkey, but uh, Turkey has the most dramatic experience in case of uh, threat to, to, to, to freedom and independence of lawyers and bars. Uh, is any other question from the rest of the panelists, maybe from uh, uh, Stephen, I don't know, from, uh, from uh, Joachim? to other panelists uh, just to install a sort of a round table. If not, maybe I can start with some conclusion because I cannot see, I uh, know, is there any question? Just a moment. Uh, Hector Herrera, Giulia Facchini. It's uh, only, th uh, thank you very much for your, for your thanks. Uh, pa, pa, pa, okay. Yes, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, just I, I take a, a remark by Giulia who was uh, impressed by, by what happened in, in Cote d'Ivoire and in the west uh, uh, coast of Africa. We are impressed indeed by the success you obtained and you are a very, a very free uh, place, a very happy island, I think, in the, in the world of threatens to, to bars because you obtained an important role for bars and for lawyers. Uh, best, uh, best compliments. You have to, to publicize it and to, to, to keep us informed more deeply. We have to learn from you on this. And then another, a bit, a, a lot of provocation, but maybe Monsieur Le Batonnier, uh, Olivier Cousin, uh, Cousy, we, we, you can use your new REPI uh, uh, uh, system and, uh, and, and uh, uh, program to help some, uh, some Turkish lawyer. I hope it will not happen, but in, just in case, you know, you can take a flight to Paris to be helped by the REPI uh, uh, project. Uh, thank you very much indeed. It's very, very, very good news from, from the Paris Bar. So if we can conclude a bit our interesting meeting, uh, if, of course, if there are no more questions from anyone. Uh, Robert, do you have any question or, or remarks to, to make before I make a one, two, three minutes of conclusion? Uh, I'll do no, I think uh, over to you. I just uh, repeat uh, the thanks and uh, the variety of responses to a fairly common problem. I'm encouraged uh, by Stephen's presentation as the success of that, and as you say, uh, Joachim's uh, description of what's been going on in the west coast of Africa and how working together, uh, raising standards and protecting independence is important. But 
I salute and take my hat off to um, Mehmet uh, and others uh, and our colleague Claudia from Mexico who are confronted with the realities of really systematic um, assaults on independence and undemanding of status. So I reflect on our local difficulties uh, at home in England and Wales and think they amount to nothing very much, but nonetheless, one remains what vigilant. But over to you. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Of course, I join your thanks to everyone. Uh, I think if I can take some conclusion, uh, I was wondering if I, I could learn something from today's panel. And indeed, you know, I imagine that each day where you do not learn something is a lost a day. But we learned a lot, a lot from this panel, a lot, I think, from the intervention from everyone, we learned that uh, international solidarity wins. The uh, good sol situation that exists uh, in, uh, in uh, the west part of Africa depends on the fact that the, the, the lawyers were together in different countries and they found allies. Uh, the success that Stephen obtained also is a, a, a little merit of us and on the other 18 international organizations who intervened to help him and to say, Stephen and the Balinesian Bar are not alone. We are solidarity, solidarity with them. We, we show solidarity with them. And I'm sure that also the important international pressure which we exerc exercised in the years uh, in favor of Turkish lawyers helped someone to make uh, uh, a new situation because you are fighting against an amendment, but you're not fighting against uh, the prison, because I remember when all the Istanbul bar was put under inv criminal investigation and some of them were put in prison and have to wait years before they were acquitted from the ac uh, accusation that uh, the government made with us. So I am sure that uh, our uh, panel today was useful and was interesting because shows that international solidarity wins. At the end, it helps. We have to concentrate ourselves in helping the most dramatic situation. At the moment, I think it's Turkey, but uh, all the other countries can have problems. Even the, the, the very civilized the UK with the uh, lawyers who fight for, for immigrants and so on. So every country has its own uh, uh, garden to, to cultivate and to, for, for the freedom and, and for the independence of the bar. And the bars, another, uh, I think another, uh, Mm, uh, uh, something we learned from today's panel is that bars are essential. If you live in Europe, you experiment the uh, attitude of our European community to say that uh, uh, lawyers have too much regulations and uh, that uh, bars are not useful. They are really useful indeed on the contrary, and uh, we have to thank the bar to exist and to help lawyers to be independent. Because when we speak about independence of lawyer, cannot exist without independence of bars. So both of them are really, really important. And I think that our panel today was a demonstration of the strength of it. I don't know if our president is still there. If you want to say some word to say bye bye, or maybe you have to let because he, he, he makes so a, a different, di di difficult life in these days. He's engaged from 5.30 in the morning to, to midnight in meetings everywhere and all the time. So I think he's no more uh, here with us anyway. So I take the, the, the possibility, I give the possibility to, to Robert to give the final bye-bye and thanks. Just, just there is a, a message from Duram. Oh thanks yes, you. I didn't see. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, Duram, where is it? I can't, re uh, uh, Rosa, help me. It but is the, legendary, said, not in understanding yes. the, the, the, the oh, questions. Yes. Uh, Jerome says, Jerry says, thank you all for a, an excellent session. Uh, well, ah, yes, I see. <laughs> At the end. Thank you, Rosa. Yeah. Th there, yes, I, I, you can read it. Uh, no. I, I, of course, as I told you, you had to leave for another meeting. Yeah. We understood that. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia and uh, Rosa. I need uh, really the help of Rosa because I'm really, uh, my, my incapacity in telematic is legendary. Thank you so much to everyone. Enjoy your uh, afternoon, evening, night, it depends where you are in the world, and uh, see you uh, very soon on the screen. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.